I'd like to introduce uh, uh, our speaker, uh, Corey Sensky, uh, Process Control Project Manager for the Pivotware uh, Division of uh, the Sooner Tools. Corey? Hello. Thank you. Good afternoon. We're here today to talk about this concept Industry 4.0, and everybody's heard Industry 4.0 before, but what we really want to do uh, is we want to first be able to define it uh, and understand uh, what it is, then we want to understand what it does. So, so what does Industry 4.0 do for us? But then most importantly, uh, we want to understand how we can apply it how we can use it uh, to enhance our processes uh, and take advantage of it within our own facilities in our own manufacturing processes. So by definition, Industry 4.0 focuses on the end-to-end -end digitization of all physical assets. Uh, so again, Industry 4.0, this is a, a term that's broad across an entire business from all areas. What we want to do is we want to understand how it relates directly to manufacturing, how it helps us produce better products at lower cost than before. In Industry 4.0, it gets its name from the idea that it is the fourth major industrial revolution. And when we look back Historically, at all the industrial revolutions, one thing is very, very important to know. If we take a look on the very far right side, it also shows the degree of complexity of each of these industrial revolutions. So first, starting with the first industrial revolution and the invention of steam power, and you being able to use steam power to help power our manufacturing plants, uh, and allow us to, to do more uh, with more energy. The second industrial revolution was the invention or the idea of the modern assembly line. So now somebody came up with the idea that rather than having one person build a product from start to finish, if we could divide that labor and create specialized tasks, we could build better products because each operator could get it could be better at building the one thing rather than the entire product. Then there was the third industrial revolution, which was the integration of PLCs, really the first computer that was introduced to manufacturing. So PLCs allowed us to do repetitive tasks. Uh, it increased our, our capacity to manufacture more efficient products. And now, with the fourth industrial revolution, 4.0 is very different than the previous industrial revolutions before it. On top of it being the most complex of any of the previous ones, it also has no direct path for us to succeed. When we look at the invention of steam power, if I want to build more products, I need more energy, and this is the most efficient way I can produce energy. If I want to have a modern assembly line, of course I'm going to build faster, better products if I divide my labor up and create specialized tasks. If I integrate PLCs, I'll become more consistent. My processes will be more repetitive. But Industry 4.0, it's not as clear. There's no direct path to say, if we do this, we'll succeed with Industry 4.0. Because Industry 4.0 isn't an idea, or it's not a product invention. It's simply a mechanism and a tool for us to use the information that we have available to us. And to create better processes, to create better products, and to get a real true understanding of our own manufacturing processes. And with 4.0, there's two major concepts that apply specifically to manufacturing. 
the first of which is big data. Big data is, is really one of the most misunderstood concepts of Industry 4.0, which is ironic because it's also probably one of the most important concepts because big data is gonna give us the information to help us create better internal processes, to get a real understanding of all aspects of our production. So again, following the same thing, first we wanna understand what it is. Big data is data sets so large and complex that it becomes difficult to process using on-hand data management tools or traditional data processing applications. With more and more smart devices being integrated into manufacturing, that means more protocols, more communication types, different communication methods, and we don't have the tools in place to be able to accept all this data and to be able to interpret it. And really, big data is all of this information that needs to be configured, it needs to be analyzed. And we need a mechanism and a platform to analyze it. But when we get down to the very, very fundamental level of big data, the very thing that it solves is time to decision. Time to decision is the time it takes us to identify a problem and use analytical data to solve that problem. And big data is the best way, the easiest way to improve that time to decision. But it needs to be done and it needs to be organized in a way that we can easily access the information we need and it includes all aspects of that information. And big data, just like Industry 4.0, it applies to all areas of business, from marketing to sales, products, to the actual manufacturing process itself, and even the service. And here are two real champions of using big data. They use them in completely different ways, uh, but both are considered industry leaders. First, Amazon. Everybody knows Amazon. And if you've ever been searching for something on Amazon, let's say you're searching for a TV. You want to buy a new TV for your living room. You do your research, uh, and ultimately you, you don't buy the product. But a week later, you're now using a different website, doing something completely different, maybe looking at a news article. And you scroll down to the bottom of the, of the page, and there's Amazon. There's an advertisement for a brand new TV. How did it get there? Amazon is using big data. They're using it to create custom, unique marketing plans directly pointed at you. They knew that you looked at that TV. They knew what you were looking to buy. And they're using the data to be more efficient with their marketing efforts towards you. But Amazon also uses big data on a macro scale. So instead of just creating this unique marketing plan for you, they now take all the other people that were looking at TVs and they look and see what they ultimately purchased. So now, Amazon can start advertising complimentary goods to you that related shoppers purchased in the end. So we can analyze trends on a very, very micro level, but it can also be used to apply it at the macro level. And with Amazon, they're using big data and they're using it and hoping to see that immediate payback. They want to see it within a month, within a week. And they're using it for marketing and sales. Then there's Tesla. Tesla is also one of the, the best big data users and understands big data uh, within the manufacturing industry. Everybody thinks Tesla is successful because they manufacture new cars that are cutting edge in technology, uh, in the design. And yes, that's true, but what Tesla understood when it first started producing cars was that, okay, we're producing these cars and we're putting them on the roads, why don't we collect the data? 
why don't we understand the roads that they travel so we can start mapping this data about where these vehicles are going, what the pinpoints on the roads are, and with Tesla, this payback of big data is now eight, 10 years in the running. And they're just starting to realize the benefits because autonomous driving, there's other competitors out there that have similar technologies, but Tesla has this big data and this information of all the mapping to be more accurate and be better at it. So two different ways of using big data and two different payback structures as well. And that's one thing that's very, very important with collecting this big data. We might not know today exactly why we're collecting it. We might not know how we can use it today. But maybe we're building products and we're manufacturing something that 10 years down the road is starting to have failures in the field. We can look back at this data because we collected it. What component went into the product? What tool did we use? Was it an operator? We can use this to get a real understanding and look back to make better decisions uh, and help us ultimately produce better products. And so within manufacturing, we want to collect this big data, but we need a way to do it. We need a mechanism that allows us to do this efficiently. And with the introduction of more and more of these smart devices into our manufacturing environment, these devices are now producing signals, they're giving us more information about what they're doing. So the Internet of Things, or smart devices, is our mechanism for ultimately getting the big data and being able to improve our time to decision. By definition, the Internet of Things is a network of physical objects that can transmit or receive information. And at a more rapid pace than ever before are these devices being introduced to our manufacturing environment. Whether it be test stations, uh, robotics, automation cells, all of these different devices are producing information that has very, very significant value to us. And with these Internet of Things and with these smart devices, it's very critical that we understand how important that data is and how important it is to collect this data and then be able to make decisions with it. So big data and the Internet of Things are really linked together. The Internet of Things produces the signal, they produce the data, and big data, or excuse me, Internet of Things are the physical objects, the smart devices producing the information, and big data is the output. Big data is the information that we're ultimately going to use to improve our processes. So again, specifically for manufacturing, specifically for production, the two most important components of Industry 4.0 are big data and the Internet of Things. And one goes along with the other. Industry 4.0, not only is it less clear how we achieve it, because if we remember back, it's the most complex industrial revolution, it also challenges us internally. It challenges us to change the way we think. From the very, very highest levels of our business, we need to emphasize that Industry 4.0 and using big data and making analytical decisions is very, very important. Harvard Business Review, uh, considered an expert on big data, says what really matters more than the type and the quantity of the data is establishing a deep corporate culture of evidence-based decision making. This needs to be driven down from the highest levels, uh, and it needs to be applied to making those decisions to help us improve our processes. So we understand what it is. We understand how it relates to manufacturing. Now how do we get there? 
how do we realize these benefits? And with big data and with all these devices on our production floor, we need to have a way to manage them. We need a platform that can manage these devices, that can interpret all this data, and then ultimately can give that information to all the decision makers so that they can make an informed decision. In traditional systems like the ERP system, MRP, MES systems, those lack a true understanding of production. Those lack the really, really fine details of how we grab the correct data from this device and then how we put it up uh, in our database so that we can reference it in coordination with the other devices we're pulling data from. We need a way to manage all the smart devices on the floor with a production-driven platform mechanism and then have that platform or mechanism be the gateway to our ERP system. And again, this is why Industry 4.0 is so very complex. There's no clear path. There's no cookie cutter solution for every single uh, organization and every process. Paul Murr of Google uh, says one of the very, very most important aspects of big data of Industry 4.0. He says that people think about just trying to collect as much information from all kinds of different places. The key difference is making sure the data is useful and accessible by the people in your organization. This right here is the very, very critical part of big data that is misunderstood. I'm sure everybody here collects big data. I'm sure everybody collects data from all their devices on the floor. But how easily can we access it? How easily can we compare our tooling data and our tooling results to our oil film sta station, to our robot? How can we make a decision that it impacts our entire production floor without seeing all aspects of this information in one location, in the one platform? So I can filter, manage, and manipulate this data to understand how it impacts the other portions uh, of my production, of my production floor. And luckily for us, there's an organization called PWC. PWC conducts the largest survey of manufacturing industry 4.0 efforts. They've uh, sent the survey to over 2,000 people, covering over nine manufacturing industries. And they give us the blueprint to achieving digital success. How do we get from A to Z? How do we understand this data? Then how do we capture it? How do we capture it? How do we understand it? It's different than us purchasing a robot. I can apples to apples what this tool does compared to this one. How long this tool will stay in production and how often it needs maintenance. With software, there's no apples to apples comparison. We need to understand what factors are important when we're making this software decision. How flexible is it? Who can access it? What's it going to do in five years? Because we want to avoid this repetitive overhaul of the systems that we use. We want to avoid that trend of every 10, every 15 years completely starting from scratch. We want a solution that will grow with our company, with our production. Uh, and that's what's very, very different about making a software decision versus making a physical equipment decision. So why are we qualified to talk about this? Why is Desuter here today telling you about Industry 4.0? Well, Desuter has been uh, in manufacturing for over 100 years. Here's Dave Gardner from Desuter to tell you a little bit more about our organization. There were five Desuters, all brothers and all passionate big leaders. <laughs> One of them, Marcel, was injured in an air crash. He lost his leg above the knee and was fitted with a wood lamp. But this wood leg was very uncomfortable. His 
younger brother, Charles, thus designed for him a new letter made of durable. This was the first light metal lamp to be manufactured. It was much more than a metal lamp, but an innovation that made the scooter a forerunner in the industry. The leg enabled Marcel to fly again the following year after his accident. Artificial limb factories were established in 1914, and Marcel became the first managing director. Wearers of the suitor's limbs were able to walk, run, dance, and even ride a horse. Orders came in from all over the world. Suter developed its own pneumatic power tools for fast and efficient production of the holes needed in the aluminum leg components. Meanwhile, the company began to reorganize their work, laying the foundations for the success of the brand today. In the 1950s, the Suter started to concentrate exclusively on the production and design of small yet powerful portable precision tools. Shortly after, with an increase in demand, the company began to export overseas. The Suter, 100 years of innovation. So DeSouter has always prided itself uh, on being a very innovative company for creating innovative solutions for manufacturing. And most recently is Pivotware Process Control. Pivotware, if we remember back from the other slide, we need some sort of mechanism, some sort of gateway to be our interface between